I think that in some ways this may be best if we go chronologically, but we can, if you feel like we can jump, if you want to okay. jump around, that's fine with me. Okay. Um, but I just think, um, you know, one, I just would love to know a little bit about your background. One of the things that we talked about um, at lunch was that you kind of speak the language of publishing and you also speak the language of tech. And so kind of what was it from your background that, that gave you the, sure. the, the both worldviews? Yeah. Yeah, so I grew up just loving media. I mean, I literally started a family newspaper when I was when I was like 11. I was the editor in chief of a newspaper in in, in, uh, college, in uh, high school rather, um, and and there's just been something about media. And I really I didn't know anything about McLuhan. I didn't know anything about the ideas that that he talked about, but that idea that media was created and that media was something that you could sort of understand. For some reason, I just sort of got a very early glimpse at that, and just became convinced that anything I wanted to do was going to be media related. Um, at the same time, you know, I'm just the right age that at 15 we got an Apple II at our house and I went right from playing to programming and, um, and I had that kind of mind that really got how, how programming works. And so without, and, and I, when I eventually met Nicholas Negroponte and learned all about his ideas of convergence and everything, I, I didn't realize again explicitly that that's what was in my head, but that idea that these are really the same thing um, was just part of my woodwork growing up. And, um, and so when I, uh, you know, I started out and actually in finance and banking, um, I then did a startup where I was mostly an engineer. Um, but in that process, I just sort of fell in love with the tech startup mentality. And that was what made me move out west. I was born and raised in New York City. And, um, and I just started looking at tech stuff, not really media, until the Wired business plan hit my desk. And when I saw a business plan in 1992 that talked about not just tech, but the idea of the culture of tech and the importance of tech as a, um, you know, not as, as we said at Wire, not just about speeds and feeds, but about the people who built this stuff. I saw my worlds converge, you know, at a very early age. And, um, and I just sort of, without really explicitly thinking about it, made a career out of playing at that, at that borderline between the two. So when we, um, when I was, I was hired as the original CTO of Wired Magazine, and, and a lot of what I was supposed to be talking about was just the theories behind the technologies behind um, the magazine's area of focus. Um, but then it became, well, what do we do online? And so that turned into this project we called Hotwired and Wired Digital. It turned into needing a business model. And so, again, having that media background, I was able to sort of bring advertising onto the internet, uh, for better or for worse. And, and it really just melded everything together in a way that, um, and I wouldn't say I'm the only one, but that made me realize that they could put me in a room with New York media people. And I knew, I knew how the model worked. I knew how, how to fund these kinds of companies and I knew how to build them. But then I could sit down with my engineers and when they would ask me questions or when we would talk about things, we could talk about how to normalize a database for the web, which actually ended up being really different than how you normalize a database for sort of for software. And, and it just became this really fun thing that we made up by ourselves at the same time as we were trying to figure out how to build business and how to sort of talk to people. How would you characterize the understanding out here in Silicon Valley of what journalism is? Yeah, I, I, so I want to be careful because I don't want to really throw this whole valley under the bus on this. But at the same time, I think, I think we've lived in an environment of the last 20 years where media is changing at the same time as technology is trying to understand how to grapple with media. So some of the older of us who grew up with Walter Cronkite, who grew up with this idea of media as a very serious sort of public interest part, especially news, as a very serious public interest part of, of being a media company, um, has been subverted by a lot of what's gone on with like cable news and some of the other areas where it's been a lot less serious. And so I think, I think news and media in general is changing at the same time as a lot of the people who are the most sort of critical distributors of media, like the companies of Facebook, Twitter, Google, and whatnot, um, are, are trying to grapple with a moving target. And so it's, it's made it difficult because we, we don't always speak the same language, but I don't think even what we would be speaking about is the same anymore. And so we really end up in a place where where we could be thinking we're having the same conversation using the same words, and yet where we, uh, where we end up with that language and those words is in very different places. Like how so? I mean, what do you mean more specifically in terms of the same words can mean different things to different groups? 
Um, well, I, I hate to get too semantic, but even what is news, you know, and, and getting into the actual idea of news. And I think he talked to some of the older guard, of which, again, I grew up in. News is a sacrosanct thing with a capital N, and it's unbiased, and it's about the truth, and it's about reporting things that have a very explicit journalistic process that's very well thought through, and, you know, journalism schools teach it, and... Um, and it's understood as a very uh, concrete and discrete thing. And, and in a world where only the people who could practice that kind of news journalism could get jobs at big entities that had to go through getting FCC licenses or had to build big printing presses, there became a, a gatekeeper on, on what is news. And there became a gatekeeper on how to practice news that meant that you were unlikely to interact with news that was um, anything other than, you know, quote unquote, serious journalism. I think we live in a world where who, the people who think they're journalists and the people who think they're creating news um, are, are, are much wider than what others who maybe are in the old guard would think of news and journalism. And so those words can mean very different things to certain people. If I'm, a, if I'm tweeting like our current president does, I could be creating news or I could be talking about what I ate today. If I'm writing a blog, it could be something that is nothing interesting and it could be something that is majorly important. And so we, we have a very confused world, especially if you're a platform trying to then make some decisions about what is real and what is fake, what is good and what is bad, you know, who deserves to hear what and what kind of filters should we put in front of them. And I mean, when you, you said, you know, there, among journalists, uh, there is a feeling as though what we do is to some degree sacrosanct. Do you think that, you know, especially among young tech engineers in a place like Facebook, is that what's understood as journalism, as something that's sort of a sacred public trust? I don't know. I'm not sure that it even matters to some extent, because when journalism is allowed to be everywhere and sit right next to pictures of my family or, or my, my dog or what I ate yesterday, even if we do understand as technologists what is journalism with a capital J and what is not, it's not always clear how you differentiate or even if it's anybody's role to differentiate. It used to be easy. A journalist was hired by a major newspaper or a major TV network and they practiced journalism. And if you saw it on TV, you could count on it being something that had some level of fact checking, had some level of rigor behind it. Uh, at this point, even if you know what journalism is, it can be everywhere. It can be a tweet. It can be a blog post. And so there's not a lot of intermediary value that anybody's providing, even Google and Facebook, that says this is something serious versus this is something that's not. And by having such a blurry environment, and at the margin, it's always been difficult to define journalism, even with the sort of, sort of normal, normal rules about what journalism is, uh, you can really get into a world that it's almost an irrelevant question. I'm kind of curious if you could tell me the story of, of how, how the, the platforms like Facebook got into the news business in a way. I would say Facebook enabled people to communicate with each other and news became one of the things they wanted to communicate with. And so many of the feature sets that you see at companies like Facebook, and this is before my time as, as a product person, uh, the features are developed almost after the fact. You see a use case that's already happened, and then you say, how can we make this use case better? And so, by use case, help me in layman's sure, terms. Yeah. Sure. So, um, whereas Facebook might have been designed for you and I as friends to share pictures, if I decide to share not a picture but a link to a New York Times or Washington Post story, I'm not necessarily using that feature the way it was designed, but it's a perfectly valid way to use that feature. And so what happened at Facebook is that somebody saw that kind of distribution of news content and said, what can we do to make it better? So rather than just put a picture in, let's go get the headline. Let's go get some, some aspect of, of the actual article itself and add that to newsfeed. And I think, and this is before my time at Facebook, I think one day someone woke up at Facebook and realized that a lot of the news industry's traffic was coming from Facebook a lot more explicitly than anybody actually said, let's go after the news industry. And I mean, did the rise of Twitter have anything to do with that as well in terms of sharing of news and the sort of competitive environment in, uh, in, in Silicon Valley, for instance? So, this was before my yeah, time sure. at Facebook, at Facebook, but um, I have no doubt that some aspect of it was the fact that, that, that there was already a, that, a lot of that going on, a lot of that news sort of discussion going on on Twitter. 
uh, and that became a sort of interesting thing to happen on Facebook. But at the same time, and this is my experience as just a user, I would share a story on Twitter and I'd get one or two responses. I'd share a story on Facebook and I would get a ton of responses, and whether it was a personal story or whether it was a news story. And I think a lot of what happened to Facebook was that it just was a much better environment for that actual discussion with people you care about. And news is a good thing to talk about. And so uh, I would say that more of Facebook's news footprint, so to speak, is because of where users took the platform than because of any competitive response to someone like Twitter. When engagement is the metric, right, and when, when it's all about what your users are engaging with, is what you're saying basically that news, Facebook learned from its users that news was engaging? Yes, I think news is always something that's interesting. It's always something that we talk about. You know, one of the things about Facebook is if you and I as users posted 20, 30, 40 times a day, we would be all Facebook needed. But when we don't, and the New York Times or the Washington Post does, it becomes a much easier way to sort of see that kind of engagement and that discussion happening, um, more so certainly than some of the, the friend sharing stuff that happens that on Facebook as well. And so, and on the flip side of it, um, news organizations are starting to recognize something at the same time uh, about where their audience is and how they're getting their traffic and where their advertising dollars are going as well. Tell me about that shift um, in kind of in, in time. And sure. yeah, yeah. I, mean, I was on the outside of Facebook for the last 15 years, really, up until 2015 when I joined. And that era, from sort of 2000 to 2015, was really about finding traffic. I think by 2000, everybody realized that the, the internet, the web, was the future of news. Certainly, uh, then with mobile, it became that much more so. But nobody understood really how to get traffic. And then Google happened. And what Google did was really became this massive fire hose of traffic. And the whole industry of search engine optimization came out to really play to that, that factor. Um, then Twitter started, and in sort of 2007, 2008, it really grew to become not as big as Google for most properties, but a really important source of, of traffic, especially on some of the higher end um, serious pieces and, and, you know, with, where journalists really like to talk about things. I think Facebook sort of came out of nowhere, you know, that all of a sudden, 2013, 2014, everybody started to look at their logs and realize that more and more of their traffic was coming from Facebook. And uh, at a time where Google had already been around for 10 years as a sort of source of traffic and SEO had been played out in a lot of people's ways, they didn't know how to get more traffic from, from Google. They didn't really understand how to drive Twitter. But all of a sudden, Facebook was just this sort of straight line up for traffic. And, um, and, and it played well to what news did and engaged people really well. And so really, from, I would say, 2013 to 2015, um, everybody was putting as much effort as they could into their Facebook traffic, and Facebook was very willing to help with that. And it, on some level, it was good for Facebook, but not so great for the media companies, in that, in part, it would drive traffic, but a lot of the advertising revenue would remain on Facebook. And essentially, almost overnight, Facebook seems to kind of take over the news distribution system for all these media entities, right? Yeah. I think one of the interesting divides between technology people and media people, technology people are used to building on someone else's platform, and they're used to the good and the bad of that. So if you're building for Windows, you know that Windows is gonna change every couple of years, and you know that Windows might change in a way that hurts your product. And there's a long history with Apple and with Windows and Microsoft of, of technology platforms making it difficult for the people who build on those platforms. Media had never had to deal with that problem. And so I don't think there was a lot of muscle memory. When all of a sudden more traffic came from Google and then more traffic came from Facebook, there wasn't a lot of muscle memory inside media companies to say, wait a minute, that's a double-edged sword. Now somebody else controls our traffic. Maybe it's going to be harder to monetize that traffic. Maybe, in fact, we're handing over some of the keys to our most important audience to a platform. And so I think some of where we ended up would, be, would have been much more obvious to a tech company uh, than it was to a media company. And I think a lot of what we're dealing with right now with media companies and newspapers in particular trying to move to subscriptions is finally, you know, four or five, six, seven years later than it should have been, the media companies saying, we really need to own that traffic ourselves. We need to build a direct relationship with our audience. 
and that was a real different learning that I think media companies had to go through over the last 10 years. I mean, you weren't there at the time, but you were there soon after. But was there a realization inside companies like Facebook as to what the responsibilities would be of becoming the main distributor of news? I don't think there was a lot of thinking about that that idea. I don't think there was any any thought that this media content or the news content in particular had had more value or had more need for protection than any of the other pieces of content on Facebook. Is that naive? I don't know that it's naive as much as reality of today's environment. News doesn't feel sacrosanct the way it used to. News in the old days when I grew up in the 60s and the 70s was done by basically three companies in the U.S., ABC, NBC, CBS, and then, I guess, also PBS and um, one or two others, you know, that, that had a, a sort of sense of gravitas to it. By the 90s and, and the 2000s with cable news and with all the different ways that people could consume news, news was just another format. You know, you had your news, you had your sports, you had your entertainment. And I think there was just much less appreciation that there was anything special about news and that news had to be cr treated differently um, within the platform world than, than any other piece of content. Was there even a discussion about the responsibilities of becoming the main distributor of news and information for a community of you know, hundreds of millions or billions of people? Was that even something that was on the radar uh, at a place like Facebook as they were becoming very quickly the main distributor of news and information? By the time I got to Facebook in 2015, Facebook was already the largest distributor of news in most areas, in most geographies. Um, so I can't speak to what discussions happened to get Facebook to that place. Uh, one, one of the things I was asked to do as the person who ran the news product for, for a while at Facebook um, was to ask questions like that. Like, what is the responsibility of Facebook? And how much of a, um, how, how much of a filter, how much of a, uh, a sort of signal of credibility and authority we should be adding to the news feed? Um, there's really two questions baked into that, though. There's the should we do this, and then there's the how we would do this. I would say the should we do this became increasingly yes between the election um, of 2016 and a lot of what we then found out was going on on the platform uh, with fake news and a lot of the propaganda that we learned about. So the question of should became a pretty easy one in the sort of 2017 time frame. The question of how, I think, is still an open question. I would run focus groups with large newspapers and broadcast news uh, journalists to ask them the question, how do we decide what is good and what is bad? What is high integrity, what is low integrity, or high credibility and low credibility? And it was a very interesting meeting of the minds between the technology world and, and the media world because I had to take the answer to that question and turn it into technology. And they would look at me and they'd say, well, we're all serious news. And I would say, great, we can agree on that. And I think we can agree that there is an extreme of, of disinformation and propagandists that is bad. But where in the middle do you sort of draw the line between propaganda and stuff that's bad and stuff that is maybe analysis, stuff that is perfectly OK in, in a normal media environment? Or even opinion or even opinion that, um, that probably um, deserves a voice and deserves distribution, but maybe needs more context so that it's understood not to be factual reporting, but it's meant to be opinion or analysis. I would say even within the journalism community, there's a lot of question about what is the difference between, for instance, news and analysis. I had a discussion with a number of large newspapers where I, I talked about the idea of tagging news posts as either news or opinion or analysis. And I had some large newspapers that said, great, that would really help to differentiate the two. I had others that said, there is no difference. Every piece of news is analysis, every piece of news is opinion, and every piece of news has reporting in it. And so I realized that even something as simple as adding a tag in Facebook's news feed that says this is news or this is opinion um, would be very contentious within the news community. 
So when was that? Get, kind of give me the timeline as to when you started really kind of thinking through the news issues. Yeah, we started thinking about the news issues in early 2016, and we constituted a group, and we were given a sort of approval by, by Mark to go forward in the May-June of 2016 timeframe. And what was the impetus for that? The impetus was this understanding that news was becoming a very important part of Facebook and that maybe it was a little different. You know, one of the things, and I don't want to claim any specific credit, but one of the things that I did as part of putting together a plan to talk about building a news group was trying to bring some of the historical perspective of the fact that news had historically had a much different role. Um, that news in some ways was the, the public good, that when news was the thing you used to justify your FCC license and that you pointed at as the, the thing you maybe lost money at but that you did because it was the right thing to do. And that it may be time for companies like Facebook uh, and other social media sites to start thinking about that kind of responsibility. I mean, in those early days, um, clearly there was a shift of thinking where maybe we should start thinking about it. But what was your sense when you walked in the building and, and, or, or when you developed that group? What was your sense of the thinking that was already entrenched at Facebook about its responsibility for news? When I got to Facebook, media content was thought more internally as public content. That was actually the name of the group that I joined. Um, public content as differentiated from the private content that you would share between friends and family. I don't think Facebook spent a lot of time thinking about the specifics of any kind of media content as differentiated from the types of friends and family content that really was its bread and butter the whole way through. Um, I think it was only in the sort of 2016, 2017 timeframe that the issues of what types of content are different, what types of content do we need to think more seriously about, and potentially bring in partners from the publishing industry to help us think through those issues. Um, that was really a later uh, process, more than it was something that had been built into Facebook from the beginning. Are you basically saying that there wasn't much thinking about what the responsibility of news distribution was? I don't think Facebook realized how important it was to the news industry until the news industry told it how much it was driving its traffic, driving its revenue model, and in some ways driving how people perceived the news industry and news itself. Um, which really happened in the post-2016 election time period. I mean, that seems late. I mean, that, to be honest, it just seems like that, that's, that's kind of surprising that there hadn't been much thought given to it at the, until then. Were you surprised by that at all? I was surprised by a lot of things when I joined Facebook. And as someone who grew up in the media world, I, I expected there to be more of a sense for how media and uh, I expected it to be more of a sense of how people interact with media and how important media can be to certain people's information diet. Um, I don't think Facebook really realized how much they were part of an ecosystem uh, that was an important ecosystem to many of those of us outside uh, that Facebook world um, when we joined, when I joined. Uh, but Facebook disrupted the distribution of news and information. And basically, it seems like you're saying that they didn't really think about what that meant, what the responsibility for that was. Um, even for the health or information of uh, its community, of our democracy, of what people know and think and believe. Um, I think many of the people who run Facebook are young enough that their worldview of news really came from the Fox News and the MSNBCs of this world, where news was not something with a capital N that had a very serious uh, and singular point of view, but rather it was a partisan thing that could be used to whatever ends you want. And so I don't think people who grew up in that environment really have the same understanding that someone who's a little older, like myself, about how news has historically been perceived. And so I don't attribute where Facebook was with news when I joined as something that is specific to any tech divide or specific to any um, naivete, really. I think that the media environment has changed a lot. And if you're in your mid-30s right now, you really grew up with, with news as a argument, with news as a, a, a cross-line discussion between two people who disagree. And the more they disagree, the better the news and the better the media. 
And I think a world where all of a sudden all news is just someone's point of view and where the more we argue and the more we fight about that news, the more successful we are, the more money we make, it becomes very easy to, to not understand how news can have any more importance than any other piece of content. When you come in there and you're charged with kind of thinking through what news is, what were the sorts of conversations you'd have with people that were of the mindset that news wasn't necessarily something sacred and that hadn't really given much thought to the idea that Facebook may be responsible for informing large swaths of the globe? A lot of what I did at Facebook as one of the older people in most of the rooms I was in was to try to harken back to the news and to the media environment of the 60s, 70s, 80s you know, that, that I was growing up in. And really trying to bring forth that understanding that historically news has had a special role that in some ways offset some of the more purient other sides of media. So you can be a media company that, that creates a lot of, you know, quote unquote, wasteland content in someone's words. Um, but if you also had a news division and if you also spent a lot of money to invest in getting the story and getting the story right, that bought you credibility. And I think one of the things that we try to do at Facebook, especially post-election, was see news as a way to reestablish the fact that this mechanism that had been built called Newsfeed um, could also have a role in trying to really up up-level the dialogue, to try to differentiate between credible content and not credible content. And that if part of the, the sort of fundamental function of Facebook is to inform the world, that informing can be telling you what your friends are doing, can be what your family are doing, but it can also tell you what's happening in Syria right now. It can also tell you how to make better decisions about your elected officials. And I think a lot of the message that I tried to bring to Facebook, and certainly that's been resonating all over the place today, is that there is an important role that a company like Facebook can provide to differentiate between the sort of serious news and the less serious news, the, the factual stuff and the opinion stuff, and try as best as is possible to make those distinctions. Um, what, it also, it, what, it, what it sounds like more than a West Coast, East Coast divide, what it sounds like is that there's almost a generational divide here in terms of an appreciation for what journalism is and what news actually is. I think there's very much a generational divide. I think the, the media world that you grow up in today, uh, whether you're a millennial or whether you're in this next generation where everybody has iPads, um, is so different from what any of us who are slightly older grew up in that it, it's really hard to understand that difference between, um, you know, in my world, what used to come on the, on the doorstep every day and what is friends and family just talking about things. And, and I think people today, especially the types of people who are you know, sort of senior executives at Facebook, grew up in an environment where content is everywhere and where everybody is a content creator. And, and those are good things. Those are not things that we should, we should shy away from, but they bring a whole new set of issues that I think we're just starting to grapple with as a, as a people. So let's go through some of the things that kind of led to um led to wanting to create a, a news, uh, th thinking about news inside, right? So, I mean, in terms of, um, there was the Gizmodo event, right? In the summer of 2016. Which one's that? Which is basically when, the, with, with the uh, trending topics, right? Oh, Sorry, yeah. so yeah. trending topics, this was- I right think that was March of 16, I okay. think. I could um, be wrong. It may have been. So, I but mean, are you able to kind of bring me through that May, May yeah. yeah. Are you able to bring me through what happened there? Um, I mean, I, sure, depending on what's the interesting part. Well, I think the interesting part is leading to the fact that here you'd had some human curation, right, of, a, of trending topics, and then accusations of sure. bias, and then you have um, basically letting, you know, taking the humans out of the equation and putting the okay. algorithm in charge. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I think what happened in, in early 16 with, with the Gizmodo article and, and, and the, the trending topics was in some ways a, a difference of understanding of what the roles of curators are. Um, what, what Facebook internally thought curation was in that case was deciding what's a story and what's not a story. When you have algorithms trying to figure out what is news, what is trending, um, you have false positives. You have things that are not really trending stories. Um, but that hit a lot of the same things the algorithms are looking for and so make them trending stories. 
And so Facebook at that point saw its role as a curator as really saying this is something that is uh, important and trending and news, uh, all of the above. Uh, whereas I think the way the Gizmodo article sort of interpreted a lot of what Facebook was doing was deciding what kinds of news stories deserved to hit trending which really was not the intent and was not uh, in any way designed the way the system was designed. And so when we talk about ways that some words can be, have two meanings, things like curation to a, a technologist just means, is this a news story that is trending or that should be trending? Whereas I think when I talk to my East Coast friends, for instance, curation is, is this important? Is this relevant? Is this something that fits within a certain editorial point of view? which was not in any way the intent, but was how a lot of the decisions that were being made were perceived from the outside. And at the time, Facebook realized it was easier to just move much more quickly towards algorithmic um, curation, again, for, for lack of a better way to put it, um, with no humans in the middle of it. Was there an understanding inside of Facebook that an algorithm making decisions is akin to making editorial decisions? It's a very hard question to answer because every one of those words, like curation decisions and editorial, have different meanings to people. The idea that you are uh, designing an algorithm that gives you more of what you want to an engineer can look like an engagement decision. If you read this and if you comment on it and if that's what we're optimizing for, we'll give you more of things that you read and things that, that you engage in. Um, in some ways, that's what a newspaper editor does too. They don't want to write stories about things that no one wants to read until it's so important that you have to write that story. And there certainly is a history of, of editors forcing a story by, by just hitting it over and over again. So I think answering questions like how editorial decisions are made by algorithms are so nuanced and difficult that it's hard, to, it's hard to unpack without really getting semantic about what those words mean. I don't think anybody at Facebook designing the algorithm, certainly in the earlier days of Facebook, would ever have used the words editorial decision. Uh, it was an engagement metric. It was optimizing for that metric and seeing how to predict what types of things people would want. Um, I think later on, there was more of an understanding that that might be an editorial decision, although a reticence to maybe use those words. And, I mean, in, in that realization, um, is there also kind of, is there a dawning understanding of the potential consequences of constantly optimizing for engagement, and what, what that might do to the public sphere? Yeah. I think certainly after the election of 2016 and, and as more of the fake news and propaganda types of hacks, which is essentially what those were, that were performed on the engagement algorithm at Facebook, there was more of an understanding that only optimizing for engagement or, or predominantly optimizing for engagement um, had, had its downsides. That doesn't mean there are easy answers as to what you do next because starting to think about things like quality or um, informedness and, and how you can move away from engagement towards other metrics that might have more sort of seriousness to them, heft and gravitas to them, only begs a million more questions as to how you look at that, how you calculate that, and how you, how you design an algorithm for it. I mean, how do you do that? <laughs> uh, there's, there's no easy answer. And um, certainly in my time at Facebook, we, we attacked the problem in a couple of different ways. We, we, looked, at, um, we looked at simply asking people um, who they trusted and what types of, of news properties uh, uh, or news publishers uh, felt more trustworthy. Um, you could look at the data and try to understand things like breadth. So what types of, of news properties are read by people on both sides of the spectrum? So maybe more balanced. Um, you, can, uh, you can look at just hiring people. We didn't do that in my time. Um, it's possible that's going on right now, I don't know, but that doesn't scale well, you know, and you start getting into language issues and culture issues and all sorts of issues. Um, and so there's no answer to that question. There's just a set of processes that you have to go through to try to figure out how to get close to it. 
I mean, the, the thing about Facebook, Facebook is really good at once it understands a problem's outcome or goal. Facebook is really good at iterating like crazy to get to that goal. So at the time when I was there and, and I left in late 17, we had spent about a year or so by that point trying to understand questions of like what is the most informative piece of content or what is the most trustworthy or credible piece of content. I know they are continuing to do a lot of that work and, and probably have invested 10 times as much as, as uh, when I was there. So I believe Facebook will figure this out. You know, this is what they're good at. Um, I think if anything, the question was just, should we have looked at that sooner? And clearly with the benefit of hindsight, of course we should have. Um, but there's no easy answer. Just going back in the timeline a little bit, what were some of the seminal moments of realizing the f that fake news was a problem? When, when did fake news sort of come on your radar screen? Uh, after the election, it became increasingly clear that, uh, to us anyway, sitting in Silicon Valley, um, that some of the content uh, that had gone through our system during the election was not only fake, but was designed to sort of specifically propagandize or specifically create misinformation. Um, we've had satire for a long time. We've had um, jokes. We've had certainly plenty of instances over the years on Facebook or other social platforms of content that didn't necessarily um, represent itself well being very successful. And, and the stakes historically have been, okay, so what? I think the, the combination of both all of the, the content that was sort of going through Facebook discussing politics, the charged environment of, that we lived in, certainly during the 2016 election, and then as it came out more that there might have been specific intentional misinformation and, and, and propaganda through you know, what's going on with potentially with the Russia, um, the Russia stuff, that it became increasingly clear to us that there was sort of a bigger issue here. Um, it's really easy sitting here in 2018 to have a very different point of view. Um, even the day after the election, uh, it was not obvious. A lot of those uh, aspects were sort of happening. Like it really, this was an onion that was constantly being peeled apart to us. And we were trying to get in front of it as fast as we could. I wanna get back to election day, but I yeah. mean, one of the things, and just some, some challenges here, right? I mean. It had been known for a long time, one, that kind of misinformation and disinformation could spread on Facebook. Um, I mean, people were talking about anti-vaccination campaigns and people were talking about propaganda abroad spreading on social media platforms like Facebook, in part taking advantage of the algorithms. Um, it had also been known for a while that fake news could spread. Why weren't these things alarm bells inside of Facebook before the election? I think it's a very dangerous question to ask how Facebook could do a better job of, of, of preventing misinformation. Let's take anti-vax, which you just brought up. Should anti-vax as a movement or as a, as, a, as a sort of idea not exist? Is it Facebook's role to shut it down? Is it Facebook's role to start looking at things that are being discussed and fact check sentences that might not have scientific basis on it? I'm not sure that's an easy or, or uh, important role for Facebook to take as, as central to it. Or maybe let me say it a different way, which is I think if in 2015, Facebook had said, we're now not gonna let fake news or we're not gonna now let things that are not commonly accepted to be to be current thinking, if we're not gonna let them through our platform, there would be a lot of pushback from everybody on both sides. Um, you know, one of the sort of central tenets of free speech is that we fight for each other's ability to say things we completely disagree with. And so it's unclear how Facebook can draw a simple line or even a complex line between things that are fake and things that are not currently accepted and things that are agreed conventional wisdom. But what if Facebook's algorithm is amplifying things that are fake or tendentious more than things that are true or factual? What if? I mean, I mean I'm not, meaning that it's one thing to say, no one, I don't know if anyone's advocating for the fact that 
um, you know, you, you can't say that vaccines are good, bad, whatever. But I'm just, the question seems to be more one of, um, is the platform designed to optimize engagement? And is fake content more engaging sometimes? Is, is our hoaxes engaging? Is polarizing content more engaging? And what does the whole system actually engender? Yeah. I spent most of my career in media. I think it is safe to say if there's one lesson that's core to media is that the more contentious, the more point of view centric, the more argumentative, the better the media. Uh, the reality is we live in a world where cable news has turned into what it is because it drives ratings. Fox News is the largest generator of, of profit um, because it's really good at what it does. Whether you believe it or don't believe it, whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it's important in a sort of example of how media oftentimes, across any kind of um, platform, um, how media tends to go towards the extreme voices. Facebook is no different. And um, yes, there's aspects of Facebook that absolutely magnify things that are controversial. Um, I'm not sure at the, at the core of that there's anything wrong with that. Um, we should be engaging in stuff that we're interested in, and we at Facebook as a platform should, um, should, uh, I'm trying to think how to say this. I think it's, it's very difficult to separate what media does well, which is provoke, which is argue, which is disagree. Or inform. Or inform, um, or and inform, in, in a way that that lets you as a platform build algorithms that decide when that's gone too far or when something that is provoking is actually just lying or propagandizing. There's no easy lines for this. Historically, we've just given that role to a human. They're called an editor or they're called a, a publisher. Um, and obviously at the scale Facebook's operating on, it's hard to put humans in front of everything, although it is now trying to do that wherever possible. But it's a very fine line between allowing someone to say something that we all disagree with, but that deserves to be said, and going to that next step and saying, no, this actually doesn't deserve to be said. And I think had Facebook spent a lot more time earlier on trying to prevent kind of these unpopular un, um, things from being discussed, it would have been just as much of a problem for everybody on the opposite side, which is saying that this vibrant new way for everybody to have a voice and for everybody to be able to connect to any piece of content is being choked by the fact that some people in Menlo Park are deciding what's good and what's bad or what's something you should see and what you shouldn't see. Doesn't that lead then to the bigger question as to whether there is something fundamentally problematic with one platform having this much power over the distribution of news and information globally? I don't worry so much about one platform having more or less power because the platforms ultimately at their core are open. When I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, there was one or two large newspapers in every market. There was three or four TV stations. There was no national cable news. Um, there was very few voices and there was very few ways if you had an alternative voice or an alternative point of view to get heard and certainly to interact with people on the global scale that companies like Facebook uh, have allowed. So I think in any new technology like Facebook, you have to ask about the good and the bad. Um, I personally believe the good far outweighs the bad. That doesn't mean we can't work to mitigate um, or, or ameliorate some of the bad that we saw. Um, but I still come from a place where uh, the technology that enables everybody to read any newspaper in the world, to talk to any other person in the world, and to talk to a large number of people um, at once are at their core better tools for democracy and better tools for communication than the world that, that I grew up in 30, 40 years ago. Um, were you involved in the decision to, um, were you involved in the decision to kind of get rid of the human curators after no. that you were? No, I was not. Oh, you were not. not, okay. No, no, that, that, in some ways that was what led to them asking me to take on news, that that was more of a, um, 
it, that was more of a, a, a systems ops kind of, or what we call community ops role. Okay. Um, that was really about preventing, the, you know, the original sort of trending feature was more about preventing bad things that shouldn't have trended from showing up. Um, and by that I mean non-news stories. Um, I think with the Gizmodo article and with this idea that we had to sort of think more seriously about our role, uh, came to this idea that let's actually build a news group whose intent is to think about these issues, and that was what that was when I really first started to get involved. So, I mean, also, uh, was your meeting with Zuck was when you were first kind of charged with this? Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I mean, I had a couple meetings, obviously. Okay. I, but Are you I, able to kind of talk about kind of bring us in the room to some degree as to what what? I, to whatever I, extent you can, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, it's, it's mean, not so much that I can't bring you in the room as it's not really interesting. I mean, it, it's it's not like a, you know, Ben Bradley fighting with whatever kind of meeting. It's it's a very perfunctory meeting. You know, I mean, we're asking for headcount. We're asking for certain types of um, product development sort of um, approvals um, that, you know, are, are not at the level of like anybody on, you know, in this audience is going to really care about it. So, but what about the thinking? I mean, was there any, how, what did you glean to be Mark Zuckerberg's thinking when you were put in charge of thinking through news? Yeah, I, I think the thing, and I, so I came as a startup guy to Facebook. So I, I was working at a company that before I joined Facebook had three people in it. Um, when I joined Facebook, clearly the scale was much larger. I think the thing that was the most interesting to me from my presentation to Mark about the news group was how quickly I got 60 heads, uh, 60 more people. Uh, and that was just the initial mid-cycle ask. Um, this was a meeting that happened not during the normal planning process, uh, which is when you would normally ask for headcount growth. And so we had a, a decent plan that said, here's some places we should start to invest in and we need people. And we were given 60 people immediately. Um, so once we started, or once the company started to think seriously about news, there was a lot of opening of the resources, which to me was um, bigger than any headcount ask I'd ever had, in fact, bigger than most of the companies I'd ever worked for. And so I think the thing that was most interesting to me about that meeting was simply that um, when Facebook decides to do something, uh, it can put a lot of resources to bear very quickly. What were, well, first of all, what was the plan that you presented and were there any kind of substantive questions from Mark or others about what your plans were? Yeah, the, the most important part of any product at Facebook is what you're optimizing for. Um, we're building products that have to work at global scale, have to work in multiple languages across um, most of the geographies of this world. And so saying something like we should invest in news isn't an answerable question. Um, we have to optimize for a certain thing to invest in news so we know what success looks like. And so the, the most interesting discussion that I think we didn't have an answer for, but that we had, was if you're going to build a news product and if part of the role of your news product is to inform your audience, which is what we suggested we should be doing, how do you define informing your audience? What does informing mean? And informing your audience in the news context can mean telling them about Syria or telling them about their local uh, politicians. Um, or it could potentially mean not, disin not disinforming or, them, not or, misinforming Or not disinforming them. But informing your audience in a broad Facebook sense can also mean telling them that your sister landed successfully in New York City on that trip she's on or that your, your friend just had a baby or that your other friend just, just got a, a new dog. And so having to build a, a site that, or a, a service that tried to ask our users if we were informing them, but to really narrowly focus that informing on things like world news or local news um, was something that we had an interesting discussion uh, in, with Mark, but no answers. And, and I'm not even sure to this day there's a good answer to that. Um, you know, especially on the local news side, telling me there's a traffic jam that's gonna ruin my commute is news. Um, so is telling me what bombing just happened in Syria. And how do you differentiate the two and how do you decide which gets more important is really difficult. If you're leaving work, that accident on your way home is much more important than whether there's a bombing going on somewhere. 
Were you dealing with also the disinformation or the misinformation problem, like inside of these discussions, right, or inside the plan? In the original plan that, that we first brought to Mark to get approval to start building a news group, uh, we did not spend a lot of time on misinformation. We tend to build products, or certainly during my time at Facebook, we tended to build products optimistically, assuming good use cases and assuming that people were not going to be gaming the system. Um, there was a community ops and other parts of Facebook that had to worry about some of those, the negative issues. And so a lot of my focus in the initial news plan was how can we do a better job of informing. In particular, we spent a lot of time talking about local news and the role that Facebook somewhat uniquely could do in the local environment. Uh, we did not spend any time in my initial plan talking about things like misinformation. Was that actually a term that was used inside Facebook, thinking, thing, thinking things through optimistically or coming up with kind of optimistic plans? Um, no, I don't think, certainly at the time, that was something that I ever heard. Um, we just built products based on trying to build some interesting use case that we had found. You know, in my case, this idea of getting people more informed through news. Um, my sense of Facebook, and I've been gone four or five months now, is that Facebook is today spending a lot more time thinking about some of the negative use cases and ways that systems can be gamed as part of the initial process, a lot more than certainly in my area than I did. So what was it like as kind of either news reports or other types of, what was it like when news reports started to come out about fake news? I mean, I'm thinking of Craig Silverman and BuzzFeed about Macedonian teenagers and a troll farm there spreading fake news um, and, you know, kind of the proliferation and how, how was it that, you know, journalists and researchers were seeing these phenomena on Facebook, but Facebook itself seems to not have seen it? Yeah, I, I think there was a... It's okay. Yeah. I, I think there's a couple of different ways that the system was being gamed in that 2016 period before the election. Um, the Macedonian teens building their fake news sites was really about monetization, at least where I saw it. It was really about getting people to sort of share fake stories that would lead ultimately to what's called an ad farm, which is a, a page with a lot of ads on it that people will then click and make money. I, I would say our first real inkling of misinformation had a lot more to do with financial chicanery, uh, ad farms, and the Macedonian teen example that, that went around a lot was really about using fake news to game the distribution of Facebook, ultimately to drive people to an ad farm, which is a site that has a lot of ads on it to try to make money. Um, we certainly in, in, the, in the news group were worried about that, but in the same way that we were worried about that kind of sort of financial goings on all throughout Facebook's history. Um, that's a problem, there's always been these kinds of things, you solve it. Um, it was really later on in the process, I think well into 2017, before some of the, the malintent kinds of propaganda behavior specifically has, has to do with Russia came out. Um, and I think that was a much different process, certainly for me personally, to think about versus the idea of just helping some people to make money they didn't deserve and trying to prevent that. Was there an awareness about the, the proliferation of hyper-partisan news sites on Facebook and the, the kind of um, really divisive content that was going viral on the platform? And was there any concern about the fact that this whole kind of ecosystem had developed on Facebook of hyperpartisanship. There was certainly an awareness that hyperpartisan content was increasingly being successful on the platform, but I'm not sure we saw that as doing anything other than mirroring the media environment that we lived in. Um, you could turn on cable news at the same time and see just as hyperpartisan content. And so I don't think there was an appreciation necessarily that there was anything special about the type of content that was going on on Facebook versus the rest of the media world. And, and quite frankly, Facebook and technology platforms are great at, at the very small market content or the very targeted content, whether it's hyper-partisan in the case of politics or whether it's about a very obscure craft project um, that doesn't ever get to the scale where you could write a magazine or a book about it. Um, that's what social media and that's what the internet and blogging have always done really well. But someone who works at Fox News may have 
occasionally a night where he or she wonders, am I contributing to a larger societal problem of hyperpartisanship? God, if, if they only have that, then, then we have a bigger problem. Right, but in the same vein, was, any, was anyone kind of, were you asking or was anyone thinking about, hey, is, is Facebook actually amplifying uh, an atmosphere of hyperpartisanship that um, the algorithm amplifies things that are incendiary or emotional um, or extreme. And during the election cycle, not after, but during the election cycle, was anyone kind of saying, hey, are we contributing to a, a fracturing of society as opposed to uh, informing society or doing something else? No. I think it's important to make a distinction that's harder to understand on the outside between news and news feed. Uh, I ran news and did a lot of the news product stuff. Newsfeed makes more of the decisions, or in some ways all of the decisions, about what types of content works and doesn't work, what are we optimizing for, whether engagement or uh, polarization. There was definitely people inside Newsfeed that were thinking about questions of polarization well before the, um, the 2016 election, because that's always been something that has, has been something to think about. Not polarization in the political sense, just polarization in the argumentative sense. If people are using our platform to just yell at each other, it's not a good user experience, and so you want to fix that. Um, I can't speak specifically to how much of that was going on when at Facebook during the election cycle, because again, it was a newsfeed thing and I was on news. Um, I would say certainly post-election, it was thought a lot more, um, not only in the polarization sense in general, but in the specific news sense. Um, and so we started to look at things like what types of news properties spoke across the aisle, so to speak, you know, that, that seemed to have what we were thinking of as common ground amongst both people on the left and people on the right. Um, but I don't think that was as explicit an area that I focused on really until after the election. And what about the term filter bubbles? Were people kind of concerned about the exacerbation of filter bubbles that by giving people what it is that they want, uh, you were in some way creating echo chambers among your users. Yeah, I think everybody in media both thinks about filter bubbles in some way or another and doesn't have that much ability to control it. The fact is your cable system could turn in the dial to a different channel. So if you're a Fox viewer, it could wake you up every morning with MSNBC and all you would do is turn it back to Fox. And so we certainly had similar kinds of analysis that said we can show somebody on the left more content that would be perceived as conservative. Um, they would just read right through it and not um, click on it, not engage with it, not do any of the things that, that are successful for optimizing the algorithm. And so I think there was a basic understanding that you can move people a little bit here and there, but that truly sort of trying to break someone out of their bubble the problem wasn't the algorithm, the problem wasn't Facebook. The problem was people don't want to read content they don't want to read. But when you have a product that is specifically designed to keep you engaged, are you not actually kind of exploiting that tendency of human beings to just want what they want and stay in their tribe or stay in their filter bubble? But don't all, all, all media properties have that? When the New York Times hired Brett Stevens, who's a conservative reporter or, or conservative um, writer, they lost a lot of subscribers, at least anecdotally, from, from things that they saw in letters to the editor that they themselves published. So I think it's, it's easy to say, could Facebook have done more or less to exacerbate filter bubbles? But I think everybody in the media world, everybody who built a product, has to ultimately ask the question of at what point do you succeed by pleasing your users and at what point do you succeed by, by punishing or giving them something they didn't necessarily want. And, and that's maybe exacerbated uh, in some ways by how Facebook works, but it's really a universal sort of requirement of building a product. What was the sort of mood in the lead up to the election um, inside from your perspective, either your mood or the kind of mood inside the company as it pertains to news and information and how things were going? Um, so the 2016 election cycle was good for the news industry uh, across the board, both anecdotally and, and in all the data that we saw. News was being read more, news was being discussed more, newspapers were getting more subscribers, people were watching more cable TV. From a media perspective, without any sort of 
idea of informing or not informing, or just from a simply a media consumption perspective, the 2016 election was great for media. And in fact, the post-2016 election was even better for media because you had a whole uh, set of people who were very unhappy and a whole set of people who were thrilled, and they both consumed more media. So it's safe to say that during the 2016 run-up uh, to the election, we saw a lot of our numbers growing like crazy, as did the rest of the media and the news world in particular. Um, and so as a product designer, when you see your products being used more, you're happy and you hit your goals sooner and everybody is, is, um, is certainly happy. Speaking personally as someone who is, is more liberal than conservative, um, we were happy because we thought that our guy or our woman in that case was going to win. Um, and so it was, it was not something that I think most of us sort of understood to be anything other than a, another election with a really um, great story to be told and a lot of people who wanted to hear that story and uh, a time when news was really coming into its own on Facebook. The Wired article has this quote from someone unnamed, but saying that like there was some sort of realization that there was a disease on the platform, right? That that fake news, misinformation, disinformation, not the Russians at that point, I take it. But was there a sense that there was that the, was there a sense before the election that the platform was in some way diseased? Not not anything I saw. I think in the specific sort of pre-election period, the thing that was most being talked about was the Macedonian teens, which was a, a monetization problem, was a, a, a hack on our monetization. Uh, I think Facebook had seen that happen before in many different ways with many different types of actors to many different types of outcomes. And so that was seen as a normal thing we had to fight. Any kind of platform, it's an arms race. You know, it, email in the 90s, it was spam. And then you figure out how to block spam, and then the spammers get better, and it goes back and forth. Um, and in that case, for 20 years. Uh, certainly, when I was at uh, Facebook during that period, thinking about things like Macedonian teens creating fake news stories, that was seen in that same light. You know, people read The Onion on Facebook and think it's true. and. Um, that's in some ways just the same kind of issue. Uh, obviously, in other ways, the intention is very different. It's specifically to be satirical, not to be, to be fake. Um, but these kinds of things happen every day. This is just a natural sort of output of being a, a large platform. So intentional disinformation campaigns was not a part of the vocabulary before the election? Not for me. I mean, Facebook already was a big company at that point, you know, 15,000 people. And there was a big community ops group that absolutely was thinking about that to some degree. I wasn't part of those discussions. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't in any way want to say that, that there was nobody thinking about that. Um, those of us building news product, you know, which was my group, um, were not spending a lot of time with that aspect of it. Mark Zuckerberg's asked right after the election um, whether he thinks that fake news played a role um, on Facebook during the election, and he basically says that's kind of crazy to think that it had any appreciable impact. What did you think of that at the time? I think a lot of us internally felt that that was not the right word choice. Um, and I think in particular, it's easy to look at, at cause and effect in multiple ways. And um, I don't think any of us, Mark included, appreciated how much of an effect we might have had. And I don't even know today, two years later, or almost two years later, that we really understand how much of a true effect we had versus Comey releasing the, the investigation about the emails or any of the other sundry things that happened around that period. So there was absolutely naivete uh, at least in my mind, in what Mark said. And I think Mark would say the same thing right now. Um, but I think more importantly, we all didn't have the information to be saying things like that at the time. And again, I won't speak for Mark, but my guess is, is that Mark now realizes that there was a lot more to the story than, than he or any of us could have imagined at that point. Did that response speak to something more endemic at the company of a lack of critical thinking or about the role in society, about the problems on the platform, about a blindness to um, potential issues? I think it was very easy for all of us sitting in Menlo Park 
to not necessarily understand how valuable Facebook had become to um, to a whole segment of people uh, who were looking for information and not getting it from the other sources that they would normally have gotten it from and who instead turned to Facebook. There was an article that comes out soon after the election that claims that some of the most viral articles on Facebook in the months preceding the election were fake and got a lot more play than the top articles from legitimate news organizations. What was the response inside the company to that revelation? I don't think it's easy from the outside to really understand what's going on in Facebook. And so typically when articles like that BuzzFeed article come out, we discount them. They're, they're interesting as, a, as an anecdote. They're interesting as a uh, sort of signal as to how the press is perceiving us and how people are talking about Facebook. But the data itself is almost always wrong and is always, almost always in service of an, a larger message rather than a, an actual analysis. So when it came to that specific BuzzFeed piece, at least in the meetings that I was in, it was more trying to understand how Facebook's role was being perceived and how this idea of fake news at the time, which was relatively new still to us, um, was becoming more and more of a story than anything about the data that he used to create that story, which we discounted. And I still, you know, when I was there, did not see anything that necessarily agreed with what he said. Um, I think you also always have to be careful about looking at the wrong metric in terms of how people uh, consume content on Facebook. I think this mistake Facebook made too, you know, where we talk about a small number of ads or a small number of stories that maybe only get a certain amount of distribution, but then go viral. And, um, and at what point are they actually being read? At what point are they actually being engaged in? At what point do they actually become problematic? Um, it's not always obvious. And so the numbers that a, a BuzzFeed would look at and the things they can count easily, like likes and reshares, aren't always indicative of the true distribution or the true sort of audience for a post. So you think that that article was wrong? I don't think the article's um, ultimate so thesis, certainly with the benefit of hindsight, was wrong, um, which is to say that it was a lot of fake news being distributed. I think trying to actually say this percent or this budget of people's sort of daily viewing was fake, I think that was wrong. That article tried to expose the weird incentives on Facebook of the virality of fake news over the play of real news, and that it is an ecosystem uh, or a news environment that will, if gamed properly, will spread fake news. So what is it like hearing that inside of Facebook and kind of grappling with that at that moment? It's no secret that Facebook is designed, and the newsfeed in particular is designed to distribute content that goes viral. In fact, one of the ironies of BuzzFeed writing that story at the time was that BuzzFeed is probably the largest successful media company to grow from understanding that virality. One of BuzzFeed's initial insights uh, was that the world was shifting from optimizing for Google to optimizing for Facebook. That it was not about being found in a universe of a large search engine, but actually getting your own users and your own readers to redistribute your content, which is what virality is. So one of the ironies, I think, you know, that at least I appreciated at the time was that Facebook being accused of distributing viral content uh, that was fake um, was not a secret to anybody, least of which the BuzzFeed people who built a company to do that. What goes into the thinking of creating a fact-checking, uh, fact-checking and introducing fact-checking on Facebook? Yeah. Kind of bring me through that story. When it became clear that there was, uh, there was fake news being distributed on our site with very expl explicit intention, um, we realized that somebody had to start making decisions as to what is fake and what is not. We didn't necessarily know what we were going to do with fake news. You know, that's a separate decision is, do you stop it? Do you stop it um, a little bit? Do you tag it? Um, but the core decision to decide that fake news or, or fake stories was a thing we had to start grappling with immediately leads to, okay, so what's fake? 
Um, having come from a journalism background, having been at Wired Magazine when it built its first fact-checking group, I was very familiar with fact-checking as an entity. And luckily for us, a year before this sort of election, uh, a group had gotten together to create what was now called the International Fact-Checking Network um, that was really a set of standards and a set of players who were going to sign up to those standards to say, we have a, a sort of official process for deciding something's true or false or some of the degrees in between. And so when it came time for Facebook to say, this is an important aspect to, to distribution content, that we need to start knowing what people accept as true or people accept as fake, that that was a better thing to bring outsiders in, both because we just needed the data and they were good at giving us that data but also because we were starting to realize that we couldn't just do it ourselves. We couldn't just build algorithms and collect data on our own, that we needed to start bringing in working with industry. I mean, in our process of journalism, we go line by line in our copy and figure out, is what we're saying true, line by line? How in the world can fact checkers go through articles and um, news stories or whatever is being shared and actually do that yeah. um, in any substantive way. So first of all, it's great that you have a good fact-checking process that goes line by line. I would say that most media sites are not there anymore. I think that's a vestige in some ways. Um, I wish there was more of it, quite honestly. Um, I think there's a separate challenge, which is media isn't consumed en masse anymore. You don't read an entire story. You sometimes read just a headline. Um, or a quote that gets pulled out and is distributed sort of separately. Um, and so in terms of fact checking on Facebook, you sort of start with the headline because that is in many ways the most important thing. You actually have to look at the pictures as well because one of the things that we found is that um, a lot of people don't understand how things like pool photography work. So if they see a fake story with a real picture of Trump, let's say sitting in the White House, a lot of people see that story and perceive there to have been a photographer sent to the White House to take that picture. And that picture itself lends credibility to that article that wasn't there because the picture was just copied from some other professional site. And so when we approached fact checking on Facebook, we weren't trying to imitate or, or mimic the sort of standard editorial process of saying, let's go through line by line and figure out what's a fact and what's not. We sort of started with how news gets consumed on Facebook, which is oftentimes the headline only and the picture only in newsfeed, and say, even if the rest of the story is true, if the headline is false, that's a false story. And from there, deciding how deep we could go into what is truth and what is false. Um, it's not easy. I don't think it's easy for media. It's certainly not easy for a platform at the scale of Facebook. And then it's not easy, I take it, to train a machine to do it. What, um, going back for one second, I mean, a headline during the campaign was Pope endorses Trump, which was not true, but it went viral on Facebook. Was it known within Facebook that that had gone viral? Um, I'm sure it was. I wasn't on the newsfeed group or I wasn't in the newsfeed group where I was looking at stories that went viral. Um, anecdotally, I knew that was a story that had gotten out. I didn't necessarily know how viral it had gotten, and I certainly didn't believe that anybody believed it. But that, would, that have been a, would that have been a red flag inside the company that something that's patently false was being propagated to millions of people on the platform? I think if you ask the question that way, it would have been. So if, if the question is, should we like the fact that our platform is being used to distribute something that is patently false? Everybody would have said, no, of course not. But I think when you ask then the next question, which is the harder and the more important question, was, which is, so what do you do about it? You then very quickly get into issues of not only free speech, but to what degree is it anybody's responsibility as a technology platform or as a distributor to start to decide when you've gone over the line between something that is satire or clearly false um, from something that may or may not be perceived by everybody to be clearly false and potentially can do damage. And, and it's a very difficult line to walk because um, we've never really lived in a world where that kind of fake story can then change so many of how people, th so many ways people think. 
And I'm not even sure today, and I don't want to sound too naive uh, or Pollyanna, but I'm not even sure today that it's obvious that that story, let's say in particular, changed anybody's vote. Media organizations like Frontline are responsible because of FCC rules. We could be sued for slander or defamation. We are held to account um, legally and uh, by the government because um, we have a license at PBS to operate. Um, you know, and, and, and much of that is what, because we're defined as a media company or we're defined as the media. I'd like to know why Facebook has avoided describing itself as a media company. Um, and why shouldn't there be rules, the same rules and regulations that apply to a broadcast entity, apply to Facebook? And why should there be such an exemption for a platform like Facebook? Frontline doesn't have to practice the journalism it practices because it's defined as a media company. It has to practice it because it has an FCC license, which comes up for a review. And the FCC, which gives Spectrum that is a sort of public, public asset, has decided that as part of having that public asset, you have a certain responsibility. Um, Facebook, like every blogger, like every tweeter, like pretty much most of the rest of media today who does not need to get an FCC license, doesn't have that same set of restrictions. So I would argue that the, the, the idea of a media company having a certain set of rules that is distinct from, let's say, a technology company really isn't the right way to think about it and isn't really how the rules are set up. And in fact, I think too much has been sort of argued about whether Facebook is or isn't a media company. If Facebook had said it was a media company 10 years ago, I'm not sure we would be any further or not along on some of these discussions. Because I think that you, what media is and what the responsibility of media, especially in a world where we have the First Amendment and such a, a sort, of, uh, sort of innate desire to protect anybody's speech, including unpopular speech, including incorrect speech, um, means that, that sort of this, these distinctions are sort of very difficult. And so even like if you talk about satire, you know, one of the things that we learned in the post fact checking world when we brought fact checking into Facebook was that a lot of sites were starting to hide behind the idea of, oh, I'm just satire. And so we actually internally had this idea of obvious and unobvious satire. You're allowed to be satirical, but it has to be obvious. You can't hide everywhere on your website that you're satire. Uh, you have to have an about page. You have to have something that says this is satirical. Um, these are very hard lines to draw because at a certain point, whether you like Facebook or don't like Facebook, it's unclear whether you want Facebook or any company with the sort of wide distribution um, sort of platform that it's built to be making these decisions. What were those discussions like with the media companies, with the major media companies in terms of what did they want to return to the past to some degree, or I mean, describe it? Certainly in jest, a lot of the large media companies would tell me they wished it was the old world, where they controlled the ability to talk and they controlled the ability to have a voice, and, and they had a very good process for deciding truth and falsity in a way that actually allowed uh, less fake news to make it through. Um, once we got past the, the joking, it then became a very nuanced discussion about the fact that there are no easy answers and that the, uh, the spectrum between only allowing things that are 100% true and allow, on, on one end, on the other end, allowing everything through, that there was a line in the middle that everybody could agree was probably the right place, um, but that everybody's line was slightly different and the tactics to sort of canonize that, that firm line in code were going to be at best complex and at most probably impossible. So this is impossible? Is this an intractable problem asking Facebook to be responsible for the distribution of true content on its platform? I think Facebook and all other companies who distribute information have a choice between being highly restrictive um, and being completely open. 
And the more restrictive you are, the narrower the audience you serve, the uh, less ability for people with new and interesting emergent voices to get out there, the ability for unpopular discussions to happen. Facebook was designed to live on one end of that spectrum, which is to allow as much freedom of discussion, allow as many unpopular and what might be perceived as marginal voices to have a voice. And that its role was really to connect everybody. Uh, open and connected was in the DNA and the message and the mission of, of the company since the very beginning. Um, I think if you look on the other end of the spectrum, you see a magazine that says we're conservative and we only talk about conservative issues and we have a voice that is very specifically one or a few people's voice about a certain political point of view. Um, where you draw that line in between is, is never simple. And a lot of the work I was doing um, towards the end of my time at Facebook was really to try to figure out not so much where to draw that line, but how to bring more of the decision making out into the open. So you could decide you wanted to agree with this because it comes from a certain perspective or it has a certain editorial process or it is or is not fact-checked. Um, and to try to, as much as possible, inform our audience of the, the basic tools of journalism and the basic rules of journalism that would allow them to decide maybe on one end this is satire or this is fake or this is not someone who has a normal editorial process versus this is an established publication that's been around for 150 years and that has all of the sort of rigors of journalism. And, and really, I mean, to bring it to Frontline, someone should read Frontline and a site done by an individual person and say, okay, one is a bunch of people who've been around for a long time with a brand and a reputation and a process, and one is just one person's thought. And there's nothing wrong with both happening on our platform. We truly and very strongly believe that was critical. But we also realized that we could do a little bit more to differentiate those two. It's one thing to differentiate. It would be another thing to say Facebook's going to actually promote certain outlets that are established or trustworthy over others that are not necessarily established or trustworthy. And what about that? What about, you know, <laughs> what about tweaking the knobs so that legitimate news organizations yeah. get more reach than illegitimate ones. Yeah. Um, towards the end of my time at Facebook, uh, and really after I left, I know that was an effort that they continue to push on. Um, for the longest time, Facebook really didn't want to make those decisions at all. Um, now there is, I know, again, just from projects that I worked on and people I've spoken with, there's more of a thought that someone like Frontline or the BBC or The Economist who might be more broadly accepted as having a good process um, should have um, more, more voice, more share of voice, um, and this has all been announced publicly, than someone who might be either uninformed or purposely trying to misinform. I mean, I guess what I'm asking, though, is was, was there an understanding inside of Facebook that that company had essentially uh, contributed to the demise of the business model of various news organizations that actually created a lot of the content that was being shared on Facebook that Facebook was benefiting from financially and otherwise. So I've been in, in internet business and, and media since 1992. The news industry by I think most people's accounts peaked around 2000. Facebook wasn't started till 2004. I don't think Facebook thinks it has any more or less of a role in, in what's happened to the news industry than Google, than Craigslist, which certainly went at a lot of the business model of, of news, uh, or a whole host of other sites. Certainly as we look today, Facebook is one of the bigger companies. Google and Amazon and others are, are bigger. But, um, so there's no question that you know, in, if, you, if you sort of sized things up today, you'd have to say Facebook is, is a um, important part of where attention is going away from things like news. Um, but I think it's, it's disingenuous to sort of say Facebook sort of, you know, specifically did that uh, or did anything to sort of, um, anything to create the environment of news any more or less than the internet or web media or any of the other set of things that have happened over that last 20 years. You really think so? You yeah. really think that, I mean, 
face, Facebook's hosting of news content has been a seismic shift for the news industry. News industry was chasing traffic. The news industry did not have to let their content be shared on Facebook. Uh, in the same way, if you, know, if you remember in Spain, they tried to stop uh, Google News from distributing uh, Spanish news content, and Google said, okay, we'll just shut down Google News in Spain. And all of a sudden, the industry realized that a lot of their traffic went away, and they said, nope, just kidding, and reversed it. So, I mean, I'm not trying to, again, be naive. I think, I think there's absolutely an effect that Facebook had the way Google and others have had. Um, but seeing it either as zero sum or seeing it as something that a bunch of just naive you know, newspaper guys saying, hey, we're just trying to inform the world and all these tech guys are, are sort of screwing our business is a very localized way of seeing the world. Um, the news industry and the media industry was one of the first sort of uh, users of internet media. I mean, in 1994, when I was helping to start Hotwired, we were in large discussions with almost every major newspaper, certainly Time Warner and others who were very active early, CNN and a lot of the news, the, the broadcast news industry. They were all there, they were all at the table, and some of the first websites were all from them. So to what degree did they not get where it was going? To what degree did they not um, stay in front of things or did they abdicate their own responsibility? Um, you know, I think is a very interesting discussion to have. But when the dialogue starts to get to these sort of tech guys are stealing time, stealing money, stealing business model, um, it really, um, it's, media's never been that way. It's always been changing. You know, the color printing press changed how things were distributed back in the 1870s. And you can go right through, uh, sorry, the, the rotary press in the 1870s, you know, changed how, how newspapers, you know, you had yellow journalism around that era. I mean, we've had waves of technology disrupting media. Media then using that technology to grow even bigger than it was before. And you know the old saw is that old media is not replaced by new media. It just finds a different place to be. And, and I think that's really what we're going through right now. Was there, I mean, it's, it's a cliche, but the, the move fast and break things ethos. What, is what happened here with the news industry and Facebook's breaks it and it moved, that Facebook moved fast and broke the news industry to some degree, and is now kind of figuring out what the hell to do with that? Is that apt? I think the news industry broke itself long before Facebook broke it in that, in that context. Um, I think in, in the, with the rise of cable news, news became just another commodity that could be changed, distributed, that lost a lot of the importance that had been built up through the 50s, 60s, and 70s and all of the sort of goodwill and the sense of public sort of good that, that news was doing. So I think by the time Facebook, which was founded in 2004, came around, news was already broken by nobody other than news itself. Um, did Facebook exacerbate or grow the ability for bad news to be distributed? Absolutely, as did Twitter, as did Google, as did the internet. Um, but I think to sort of live in a world where a bunch of technologists who naively sort of went into this void trying to break things um, are why we're here is really missing a sort of a whole ecosystem that um, well before Facebook was created um, already had done a lot to sort of damage what it had built. Mark Zuckerberg has said he feels fundamentally uncomfortable sitting here in California in an office making content decisions for people around the world. What's What's that about? <laughs> um, Put it in terms of Mark, maybe. Yeah. I think one of the things that, and, and, and I wouldn't in any way want to speak for Mark, but I think one of the things that I've seen change in, in certainly the public speaking that Mark has done is more of an understanding of how this platform can be both used and abused and how um, things that seem obvious to someone programming a, a, a certain specific problem or someone trying to build a system that optimizes for a goal like engagement can have a number of attendant sort of side effects. You know, 
either unexpected or, or certainly underappreciated. And so I think when Mark says things like that, when he's really sort of putting voice to the idea that even if you spend a lot of time thinking about the negative uses of your platform, even if you don't build products as optimistically as I think Facebook has built, and you try to spend time thinking about all the things that can go wrong, there's only so much that you can do. There's only so much that once two plus billion people have access to it that they either for good or for bad reasons can, can subvert those. Um, one of the, um, I think one of the critical things that you know, is being discussed right now around diversity in technology is that same idea that you know, whether it's a bunch of white men in Menlo Park or whether it's just a bunch of people in Menlo Park, um, at a certain point, it doesn't matter how diverse that audience is, it's not the two billion people that use the product every day. And that that's an inherent limitation that you can never get around, that you have to accept. And that once you accept it, requires a different type of product development process or a different type of, 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 um, of managing the risk of downside uses of, of the platform. What it sounds like is that he's uncomfortable with his power to some degree, and the power of drawing lines for this many people on his platform. But it's also, he built this thing, right? I mean, he built something and acquired this power, and now is starting to say, oh my goodness, I'm responsible for it to some degree. And I mean, isn't it, isn't it a little bit late for that? Or isn't it just so bizarre that we're isn't it so bizarre? Isn't he just? Isn't he detecting how bizarre it is? How much power he has at this point? Yeah, that's a that's a hard question for me to answer because I don't want to presuppose what Mark is thinking. Um, I I think if you look to the original mission of Facebook, make the world more open and connected, has at its core a very strong and important thing that Mark truly believes. And I believe to this day. I believe. You know, which is that the more people talk, the more people can connect, the more that people can consume all points of view, the more that people can meet and talk to all types of people from all different types of social strata and ethnic and, and racial groups, that that at its core is a good thing. And I think, again, I haven't talked to him about this. I don't know him that well. I think Mark believes that still to this day. I think what's changed is that we have a lot more knowledge now about some of the bad things that can also come from that that when anybody can talk to anybody, people who have bad intention um, or who want to try to change people's point of view through lies and propaganda um, have the same platform that the people trying to use it for good intentions are. And so that there is a responsibility to make some of those, those, um, those technologies that facilitate all this communication and all this openness to have some limits, to have some barriers. I think that's something that probably Mark would also agree to. I think that next step though, which is then how do you execute against that? How do you build those products? Who decides? Who decides um, what types of messages go over the line between good, bad, indifferent, um, fact versus analysis? That's where it gets really messy. And, and I do think Facebook has, as much as any other company, a good understanding of how to build those kinds of processes, how to, how to work through all of the issues and iterate. The thing about move fast and break things is that it doesn't build in this idea of we're always right. It builds in this idea that when we're wrong, we have to realize it and fix it quickly. Because break things is, is not the goal. Break things is the tactic that helps you get to the goal, which is a better site that people wanna use. And that sometimes you shouldn't overthink you should just go and do it and then figure out how it breaks and then fix it. I think the big change that's happened, and this happened long before fake news and long before the 2016 election, is this idea that at a certain point you get to a scale where you can't always be breaking things. Whether because technologically two billion people trust you every day to be around and you can't just be down, or whether because there are bad uses of the platform, like distributing fake news. So. I think long before the election, Mark had already understood the limits of move fast and break things. I don't think he necessarily, or I don't even want to speak for Mark, I don't think any of us necessarily understood that that ethos of let's see how it breaks and fix it can sometimes mean that 
really damaging things can happen while you're figuring out how it's breaking and then going to try to fix it. What was your reaction when the news of the Russian interference started to come to light? My reaction when the Russian uh, disinformation campaigns came to light was probably more the reaction of a human, of, a, of an American, um, than it was of a product manager. Um, I think I like to live in a world where I believe that on balance people have good intentions, that I believe that people are not trying to sort of specifically sow discord, specifically push on the, the differences between us. And so I was obviously um, unhappy to find that that was happening full stop. I was even more unhappy to then find out it was happening on a platform that I had something to do with. Um, were you curious at the time how this was not detected, how Facebook had failed to stop it? I mean, what, what kind of questions did you have at the time about it? Yeah. No, I, I was not curious because I knew how it was to be done. The, the difference between somebody trying to have an alternative or provocative point of view and somebody trying to sow discord with a very specific goal of destabilizing a government is only in their intention. The means are the same, the tactics are the same. Um, you know, one of the things that was brought up in one of the congressional hearings early on was that they paid in rubles. Well, I think Facebook has 60 plus currencies. Many Russians use Facebook every day for perfectly reasonable things and they pay in rubles. So the fact of any specific aspect of how that Russian information was was sowed, or at least how I understand it was it was it was sowed, were just normal uses of the platform. The hard part is adding up all the pieces of that and understanding the intention by in some ways looking at the outcome and looking at the approach to try to figure out when someone moves from the normal ways we should all be able to disagree and have a voice about those disagreements. And the extreme ways that the platform was clearly misused um, you know, during the election cycle. But I think it's, there's almost no difference. I mean, it's sort of the same thing with fake news and satire. Um, really, you could write the same story and on one hand make it a fake news story, on the other hand have it be satire. And I'm not sure, unless you really understand the intention of the writer, you can differentiate those two. And I'm not trying to suggest Facebook should allow everything, because it shouldn't and it doesn't. Um, in fact, Facebook doesn't allow a lot, Facebook for events a lot less than Twitter and other platforms. So in some ways, Facebook has been ahead of this issue compared to most of the rest of its platform brethren. Um, but the point at which something becomes divisive speech versus unlawful propaganda is not easy until you understand the intent of the person creating it. Facebook did a very slow roll in terms of coming out with information and being completely forthcoming about what had happened on Facebook yeah. during the election. And what was that like for you watching that and being there and seeing how Facebook was responding? Um, on, the, on one level, it's always disappointing when the company that you work for and that you've invested so much of your time is um, is clearly either behind the story or being perceived to have made you know really egregious mistakes. Um, as somebody who's been in this industry for a long time and as somebody who's been you know a, a student of media for so long, um, I realized very quickly that the important discussions were not happening in the press. They were happening in, in the boardrooms, they were happening in, in product development meetings, they were happening in meetings with partnerships that you know, I was sort of a part of, certainly on the news side. And that we needed to get some of the emotion out of it. And I, I got the emotion, I felt the emotion, which is anger, which is unhappiness. Um, to some degree because our candidate didn't win, in, in my case. Um, and in other degrees because you don't like to think you're building products that were so misused. Um, but I think fundamentally the most important thing I was feeling at the time was, you know, thank God we're now aware of it so we can go fix it. Um, because I do feel huge respect for Facebook's ability once it understands a problem to go solve that problem. And while I certainly understood and to this day understand how nuanced and difficult these answers are, um, 
the iteration and the development that just has to happen over and over again while you get little by little towards the sort of nub of the problem is a thing that Facebook, I think, is probably as good as anybody in the world at, at sort of solving. In the news business, we'd been asking for a long time for Facebook to take its role seriously and think about news seriously. Um, why did it take until 2016 and your group to start taking it seriously? Facebook really, from the beginning, has been about friends and family. And other types of content like news um, were really seen, in fact, in the parlance of Facebook as public content, just this other thing that, that we didn't control as much of. Um, news was not really seen as needing anything more special than that. Um, I think really until the user experience of news got bad in the sort of 2014 and 15 era, which is when the company, and this was before my time, decided to build Instant Articles. Instant Articles was really the first product um, that said, hey, publishers, here's a special way to use our, our system, create content that would be native to Facebook and that would be faster and would have a cleaner user experience. And, and I think... At the time, Facebook saw a platform technology decision, which is here's a faster way to distribute news content. And I think the news industry saw we're partners now. And I think that difference wasn't really appreciated internally as much as, as certainly that I understood it, because I was on the outside when Instant Articles was created. And so I realized that this was something that was the industry saying, we're happy to get in bed with you, Facebook, but we expect more of you now. We expect a business model now. We expect more distribution. And Facebook wasn't really answering those questions or even thinking about those questions when it initially designed Instant Articles. A year later, which is when I was asked to, to start focusing on news specifically, I and a few others were saying, no, we need to get more explicit about our support for the news industry. We can't just say, hey, use our product and, and be happy. Uh, we had to start thinking about their business model more. We had to start thinking about if they were going to use our Instant Articles product, they had to have a certain set of monetization or they would just stop using it. And so by the time mid-2016 mid came around, enough people realized that this was something that we should support. And when I say this, I mean a relationship with the news industry that was more collaborative, that was more two-way, that enabled us to then invest much more heavily in the product. Last question. Again, kind of coming back to the post-election moment. After the election, there was this term post-truth era, kind of post-truth moment, um, in part because of what had happened in 2016. W was, was part of the reckoning inside of Facebook for Mark Zuckerberg, for you, for others, what was Facebook's contribution to creating a post-truth world? I don't believe we're in a post-truth world. I think that's a convenient way for certain people who are running the country right now to try to take some of the heat off their lies, their misinformation, their desire to have people believe a truth they want to believe. Um, I still live in a world where truth is truth, uh, where a fact is a fact. Um, I think those of us at Facebook uh, that had these discussions when I was there would all say fundamentally the same thing. I think one of the hard lines to walk between making the world open and connected is asking the question, what responsibility do you have to people who don't necessarily have the skepticism, don't have the media literacy, don't have this understanding that because something appears in print or because it appears on the internet, that it's 100% true. And I think the, the more interesting discussion to have right now is what can we do to lift everybody up to a place where truth is back to being thing with a capital T, where we can all have a common set of facts and we can then argue about what we think we should do with those facts, which I think is a much better place for the platforms to be and a much better place for democracy to sit.